And now, Gumption TV presents... Hello. Hello, testing. Hi, kids. This is your old Unky Judas. And welcome to Storytime with Unky Judas. I am ready, ready for some stories with my Unky right now. We have Steamy Ray Vos here in the audience. Uh, he's the one that actually encouraged me to do this. Thank you. Uh, he tells me that there's people on YouTube that get paid to tell all their crazy stories that they have encountered over the years, particularly while being on, shall we say, mind-altering substances. Um, not trying to, to um, incriminate myself or anybody else, you know, so we're going to try and use code names and code words. Um... The challenge, originally, he was telling me about a guy who p just shows video games in the background and tells his stories. So, I'm not into any of the new video games. Uh, I haven't really picked up a video game controller since the Super Nintendo, so we're going to throw things back a little bit and pull out some Donkey Kong Country. The challenge is, well, originally was to tell a, a, a drug story or uh, something of the like for every level of Donkey Kong Country, which I am confident I probably could do, but some of those stories are going to last way longer than it takes to beat one uh, one level. Huh. In fact, uh, for how long I've been talking without even starting this story, um, fuck, I've probably already beat like half the level <laughs> of the first, because it's an easy one. So we're just going to... Beat the entire game of Donkey Kong Country and see if I can at least fill that time space with, you know, enough crazy stories from Monkey Judas. All right, so I figure it'd be appropriate to start out with one of my very first encounters with the law uh, involving illegal substances. And this is probably when I was about uh, 19. You know, um, I had just. I kind of quit smoking weed or any of that stuff. Uh, I went to the boys' ranch. I had just been brainwashed, and I came back a good Mormon boy, ready to go on a mission and all that. You had already quit by that point, by 19? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I kind of had a, a strange upbringing. I wasn't really ex exposed to any of the party lifestyle until a little bit later on, you know. Um, I didn't drink till I was like 17. I didn't really smoke till I was like 17. And I only got drunk maybe three times. And I only had been smoking weed for like maybe three months before I got sent to the boys ranch. Now that is a whole nother story. The boys ranch. Yeah, we could talk about that, but we're not going to. Uh, nonetheless, I got out of the ranch and I was Mormon and straight edge because that kind of helped me to like, I don't know, stay off the drugs and still kind of try and be cool and not just be some Mormon little sissy kind of thing. I still wanted to make music. I still wanted to be in bands. And the people that I knew were mostly into, like, hardcore and punk and stuff. And the ska thing was kind of on its way out. Uh, but I knew that that's what I still wanted to do. And um, I at least luckily found some people in Lehigh that um, were kind of in that same sort of attitude. So I sort of just started palling up with them. And we made a band and we got the idea to sell weed to raise money for the van without smoking any of it ourselves. So we were going to just get straight profit, which we figured, man, you can make a lot of money off weed if you're not smoking any of it. And, th and this still really goes against, totally goes against straight edge principles and standards. Now, keep in mind, we were nonviolent straight edgers. You know, we didn't just go around curb checking people and fucking with people just because they didn't believe in the same thing we did. Uh, and back in, th at that time, there was a pretty big problem with that sort of thing around, especially Utah, um, but not so much down in Utah County. You know, Salt Lake for sure, um, and pretty much anywhere else. Anyways, uh, of course, one thing leads to another, and I wind up going back to having a, you know, you got a whole QP. You know, and this this chick that also joined the band, we're going to leave her name out of this. We'll just call her Kahunt. <laughs> um, she, <laughs> Kahunt Fahasi. Um, she 
did smoke. And she was actually kind of the one that came up with the idea to purchase this QP and raise money for the band. And she kind of lied about not really being into weed. And one night she was just like, I, I'm going to smoke some of this weed. I help pay for it. And you can't stop me. And after much deliberation, I was finally just like, okay, if you're going to smoke it, I'm going to smoke it. She was like, no fucking way. And I was just like, don't, don't say anything or else I might change my mind, you know, because I was still good Mormon straight edge boy. <laughs> so that is how I kind of started smoking again. And, uh, of course, this band did not last once that happened. And it was just her and me every night smoking the rest of this QP <laughs> <laughs> to ourselves. Uh, and, of course, we're, st- we're still kind of younger. Both of us still live with our parents. She had a car, so she would just come pick me up, and we would just go cruising around the back roads of Lehigh back when there wasn't as much development, and you c- actually could get away with that back then. Um, so there was this abandoned house. Um, it's not there anymore, and it was just kind of off the freeway. Um, anyone who's familiar with Lehigh, I don't know what about what year this would have been good fuck maybe 20 years ago or so (laughs) um i'd say maybe 2001 2002 ish around there so anyways there was this abandoned house really small house that was just up the road from the freeway kind of behind where like albertson's and walkers and all that was just a little bit further south of there just a big field in this house and we kind of had a thing for abandoned houses anyways you know i always have i always will you guys like involved with each other more than just the band yes we definitely started getting involved pretty quick um and then we hooked up and stayed hooked up for a couple years actually (laughs) yeah uh she popped my virgin cherry (laughs) anyways that's a whole nother fucking story too (laughs) so anyways uh, um we (laughs) We go into this abandoned house, and there's graffiti all over the walls, just like 420 and SMP, really shitty stoner graffiti, uh, you know, no good graffiti, and uh, paraphernalia all over the place. And so we figured this place is chill, and we could just start coming here on a regular basis. Of course, we were very young and naive at the time. So um, we actually started treating this place like we made a bong museum downstairs. Like an actual, like, because all of our paraphernalia was homemade because we didn't want to, like, hang on to it. And nobody really had the money for an actual, like, store-bought pipe. And the only place to buy a pipe was several towns away, you know. Uh, So we just make our own. And any time it started tasting too shitty or, like, it would air was leaking through it, we retired it to the Bong Museum. And so we had this fucking museum of paraphernalia down in this basement here and there was this particular closet in the basement that we like to get uh hot boxed and so uh it was me and her one day you know and we'd been here many many times and i had just bought x amount you know just a, a new fresh bag and i rolled a j and um we heard a seat we heard the walkie talkies upstairs and I start to panic because, you know, I'm still young. I've never had a run-in with cops, especially with any illegal substances on me or anything. First time ever having anything like this happen. So I'm freaking the fuck out. And we're just stuck in this fucking closet in the dark. And um, I was just like, we got to fucking, you know, jump out the window or we got to get out of here. He's like, no, we got to stay here. If you run, then you're in more trouble. So she insisted that we just stayed put. They come downstairs, and they find us, and it wasn't cops. It was the fire department. And they're just like, what are you guys doing down here? And we're just like, uh, we just kind of like abandoned houses. Uh, we, you know, like, look at all this, this stuff. Uh, and they're just like, that's quite a bit of paraphernalia. Yeah, 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 look at that. What, a, what do you know? <laughs> so we're, we've never been here in our fucking lives, swear to God. We were just checking the place out, you know, just passing by. And they're just kind of like, okay, well, this is still a little suspicious, but we're looking for a kid. Have you guys seen some random, like, 14-year-old boy? And we're just like, no, no, definitely would have remembered seeing something like that. And they're like, yeah, he lives around here, and I guess he used to hang out here, too. And I'm just like, oh, he sounds cool. (laughs) So they take us outside, and they're like, okay, we at least have to conduct a couple of field tests and, you know, make sure you're good. And it was, like, the most basic, pathetic, like, 
follow your finger with your eyes and then checking the back of your throat and uh, see if it if there's green on the back of your tongue or some shit and that's supposed to indicate that you have smoked weed apparently is there okay let's just let's just test this let's test this look at the back of my tongue No, no, yeah. All right, folks, that urban myth has been debunked. (laughs) I hope that you fire department and police officials are listening because that doesn't work. Anyways, uh, we hadn't smoked, so we got away, and our car was parked just a block or so down the street. And we, I think we were sketching, and so I think we, if I remember right, we walked back to the walkers, to the gas station, to kind of like throw them off of our trail. And I had this black and white duffel bag, and it had all of our, you know, um, our stuff in it and a pipe. And um, as we're coming out of the walkers, the gas station, uh, there's a bunch of cops waiting for us. And we're just kind of like, oh, hi, are you guys looking for the missing child? And they're like, I actually know the fire department guys kind of tipped us off. And they said that uh, we should come fuck with you a little more. <laughs> And we're just kind of like, that. We, we, they already searched us. They already questioned us. You know, we're good. And like, actually, um, we're going to take a look in that bag. And I'm just kind of like, uh, well, first, they told me to come out. And as I was coming out, I handed her the duffel bag. And she was heading to the bathroom. And they're like, no, 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 you too. And so, um, yeah, she hands me back the bag. And... They pretty much left us no choice. We sat there on the sidewalk just saying, no, you you know, you have no reason or need to look through this. And they're finally like, if you don't give us the bag, we're going to take it anyway kind of thing. Um, in you know, Not exactly in those words, but pretty much in those fucking words. And so I just kind of look over at her reluctantly and just slowly hand them the bag. And, of course, you know, it's like the first thing they see. Is a, you know, a baggie in the little glass pipe. You know, my first glass pipe I ever bought. <laughs> and there it goes. I would much rather have broken that thing. Just let it fall on the asphalt or something and, and lose a pipe like, like a good pipe would be lost. And that's another thing for anyone listening. If you've ever dropped a pipe on the linoleum and it shattered, that's really the best way for a pipe to go out. Way better than giving you away, that's for damn sure. <laughs> yes, it's much, much better than um, getting taken by the police. Uh, nowadays, see, this was damn near 20 years ago. And that's kind of the trippy thing about this is here we are in 2021, and things are a lot different. Sure, uh, there's plenty of places where you can still run into problems just like this, if not worse. But here, even around here, I never thought I would see the day that there was a dispensary in Provo. I mean, not anyone can get into it, but (laughs) still, we're making fucking progress, and especially back in 2001 when this happened, I never would have dreamed. You know, I'm just like, that shit you would read in High Times magazine, talking about their trip to, you know, fucking the Netherlands, (laughs) or whatever, and that's what it's like over there, in countries that are truly more free than we are. (laughs) So anyways... I'm going to take a swill of water here. (sighs) Good old non-alcoholic water. So anyways, they take the bag. They find the pipe. Um, She's underage. I think I was like 18 and she was 17. So, you know, they could have even got me for statutory. (laughs) No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Their parents were cool with it, so yeah, I think it comes down to the parents. And you know, I was all right with a, a good standing with the father, at least, and that comes into play later on in this story. So, um, they take—I think they took her home. They um, immediately, she, like, her license was suspended, and um, she couldn't drive, like, right then and there. And they took me to jail, and I sat there. I got through booking, and then they take me into that room where they, you know, pretty much strip search you. And he starts patting me down and uh, asks me if there's anything in my pockets. 
And I'm like, no, they took it all. First thing he pulls out of my pocket is the fucking joint I rolled while I was sitting in the closet. And I look at him like, oh, fuck, I totally forgot I had that. And he's just like, no, 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 no. I don't think, what? And he's like, no, what? No. You already got popped for weed. We can't charge you twice for the same shit, right? So technically, like, you're... Your paraphernalia and your weed is already in the evidence locker, and this joint technically doesn't really exist. And I'm just like, oh, fuck. Oh, cool. And he's like, now nah, take off your clothes. <laughs> oh, all right. So after that whole thing, I sit out there in the lobby, and I sit out there for a fucking while, you know, um, and I watch other people come in, and then and they switch their clothes out. They put them in their... Uh, they're nice, fancy little, you know, jail outfits. And take them to their room. They take them to the shower and put them in their fucking room. And uh, more and more people keep filing through and going through the due process. And I'm just sitting there in the corner and watching these fuckers. Um, around 1 a.m. rolls around. And Officer Sly <laughs> kind of slinks around the fucking the wall. And it's sort of like, hey, hmm? You've actually been pretty cooperative. Uh, we decided that if uh, if you can get a ride out of here, we'll let you walk tonight. And I'm just like, no shit, I will walk out of here. And it's like, no, no, actually, we can't legally let you walk home. And, I mean, this was clearing the fuck down in, like, Spanish Fork, and I lived in Lehigh. I still would have w- taken the walk. Even though if 1 a.m., don't care, get me the fuck out of here. But I guess they legally can't let you do that. I don't remember what stupid reason why. If I thought hard enough, I could probably come up with a few. Um, I don't know. Maybe you might kill someone on your way out. I, if you're walking, you, you, you get pissed. You, you, you might get killed. Somebody be like, that guy's walking out of the prison. He probably raped someone. I'm going to run him over with my fucking pickup truck. Or your bus or your tractor. Because we are in Paisen. People have that shit. So... Um, who else do I call besides Kahunt, you know, my girlfriend at the time? Because I'm not going to call my parents and say I'm in jail at 1 a.m., <laughs> you know. And I'm pretty sure they already knew because my brother happened to have been pulled up at the walkers while I was getting arrested. And he actually was cool. He handed the officers his um his prepaid legal card just to see if it would help, which, of course, it didn't. But there was still a nice gesture of him, you know. Uh, and if, I'm pretty sure he told the Padres that what he saw, <laughs> you know. Um, and, you know, that Walkers in Lehigh was, like, the only place for anyone to hang out. So I'm sure a lot of fucking people saw it. But anyways, um, I call her up. And, of course, she can't drive because she just got busted. And, they like, it sounds kind of weird because usually you got to go to court before you get your license taken away, right? But they didn't do that. You know, she just, like, that night could no longer drive. And I told her that if you could come get me or, I don't know, could your parents come get me? Just somebody could drive. I can actually get out of here tonight. And so she asked her dad, who he's pretty cool. He used to be in a band. He used to be in a band called Sojourn, which actually apparently used to be kind of big back in, like, the 80s, whenever they were they were kind of like a butt rock hair metal band. And um, they, they actually had a couple good songs, to be honest. Uh, I've heard uh, an album or two of theirs. I actually still have In the World of Spirits, and uh, it's got, like, one decent song on it, maybe two, from what I remember. You know, for being butt rock, that's actually saying a lot. Because <laughs> I fucking hate butt rock for the most part. So, anyways, uh, he's he's now Mormon, and um, I think he had some sort of position in the ward, like, uh, not like a bishop or anything, but... Some kind of important dude in the church. And uh, so upstanding guy that used to be a uh, rocker. Um, in fact, he took us to the Tool concert. <laughs> and it, that was an interesting experience. But anyways, um, he had already taken his cocktail of sleeping pills. You know, I'm sure Ambien had to have been one of them. Because, man, I have done Ambien and been fucked up on Ambien. There's two ways to do Ambien, and we could tell that story another time, too, because I got a great Ambien story. 
Um, but, but you you either take it orally and um, you stay awake through the drowsiness and then you start getting all bonkers. Uh, and you almost hallucinate. Not quite, but you dissociate. It's more of a dissociate um, than a hallucination. Oh God! Yeah, yeah. We, we'll 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 t- we'll talk about Ambien in a, in another story, cause yeah. Um, or you snort it, and then you immediately feel the effect. But anyways, he obviously just took it like any other person and stayed awake long enough to start tripping. And I don't know what other drugs he was on too, but he should not have been fucking driving, dude. <laughs> and that was another fun part. That was another fun part about this whole experience was seeing him all fucked up. You know, this this fucking upstanding Mormon guy who used to get fucked up, currently fucked up, and driving. It was fucking great. He he kept putting his hands above the steering wheel and driving this imaginary steering wheel. And, and Cahoon had to keep grabbing his hands and putting them back on the steering wheel and shit. And he'd get his face real close and then, like, peek a boo above the steering wheel. And then he would back up and do again and just peek his head above the steering wheel again and he kept asking some of the most ridiculous questions about like well I'm not going to get into it but like you know love affairs and whatnot. Like not like affairs that he had but shit with his wife and shit that's less like you know do you think that like your mom would love me more if I <laughs> you know, shit like that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and I kind of, I'm just sitting here laughing and just looking over at her, just like, oh my fucking god, this is your dad right now. <laughs> and he's like, no, I want you to to promise that uh, you're never gonna do drugs again. <laughs> I just kind of laugh out of the corner of my breath. I'm just kind of like, wait, is there a corner of your breath? Yeah, we're just going with it. Out of the corner of my breath. <laughs> I think I just combined two figures of speech. So out of the corner of my breath, there I was. I uttered, you want me to stop getting fucked up? And he's just like, oh, fuck you. And I just, again, start laughing. I couldn't contain myself. I look over at Cahoon and I'm just like, your dad just said, fuck you. (laughs) Your Mormon ass dad said, fuck me. I was loving it, and plus I got out of jail, so it's like one of the greatest nights for me in a long time. You know, anyone who has ever gotten the fuck out of jail the night you got brought in knows how that feels. It's a great fucking feeling, isn't it, folks? Yes, it is. So, um, I don't remember. I think I had to sneak in the window to my parents' house, assuming that they didn't know about it. You know, and of course uh, they did. And um, later on, like months and months later, and no correlation to this story, I got kicked out of their house. Um, I wound up living like in a garage and then I wound up living in like a camper with like no electricity or plumbing or, uh, (laughs) you know, phone or anything out in the middle of nowhere in the desert and Eagle Mountain. And this whole time I had been trying to fight this case in court because I I was under the impression that it was illegal search and seizure because the police department or no the fire department sorry had already dismissed us they'd already said that we were good to go they interrogated us and then we were interrogated a second time by the cops and so I figured that this was some kind of illegal search and seizure because we had already been dismissed and I don't know if that would have held in court. I have no idea, but I still was going to fight this. I requested a public defender, which I would recommend to anybody anytime you're in court, unless you just know you're fucked or unless it's a really minor charge. Always ask for a public defender if you can't afford your own defense. Um, And that's just my advice to anybody. Uh, It's it's always fucking helped me every time. I've never regretted it. Even the the kind that aren't really there for you and could give a shit less what happens to you, I still wind up getting my charges reduced. You know, I got less than what I would have had I not asked for a PD. This PD was cool, though. A lot of times, I'm pretty sure that they actually work for the courthouse themselves, and I'm pretty sure this dude was an independent, um, like his own agent, because his office was way over in Provo, and you had to go see him yourself, and I actually got to uh, talk to him 
I can make personal appointments with him several times before the the court date. And every other time I've been to court for anything, you don't get that out of a PD. And he's usually just appointed right there, and it's the same guy for everybody who goes through there. This dude was only there for me, and I don't know how I got that special of, of treatment. Maybe it's just because that's how Lehigh does it, and Orem doesn't. No idea. But this dude was cool. He actually gave a shit about winning that case for you. Um, Kulas was his last name. He was a, a, a Hispanic guy, and he was badass. Um, so the day of the court, he asked if she could come in too, my girlfriend at the time, Kahunt. And um, – he wanted to hear her side of the story, and she's telling him about how, like, I handed the bag to her, and she was kind of trying to claim the bag was hers because she had already kind of been charged as a minor for the, uh, you know, for the paraphernalia and for the bag. So when he heard that, he immediately slams his book shut, and he's just like, oh, this is going to be easier than I thought. Case closed. And we're just like, What? And I was just like, I was about to tell you about the illegal search and seizure. What are you talking? He's like, no, 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 you don't even need to. Uh, why? Because it's double jeopardy. You cannot be charged for something she's already been charged for. And I've been told later on, somebody said that that's not what job, double jeopardy is, but that's what he called it, and that's kind of his job. He's like the professional. And so he said, basically, yeah, that she's already done time. She's already been sentenced and been punished for that particular crime. And he brought it to, in front of the judge. In fact, this part was great. This is one of the best parts of the whole thing. Um, you could tell right when we walked into that room that the PD and the prosecutor fucking hated each other. And if there's anything more that you could have going for you in court, besides like an independent PD that actually gives a shit is to have a rivalry between the fucking prosecutor and the PD because he's got now he's got even more motivation to win that case because he fucking hates the prosecutor and he wants to piss him off even more and so yeah he walks in and he looks across the room at the prosecutor and I watched it their eyes meet and he just struts in there and he's all like oh you want to go three and oh and the motherfucker's face got red dude he just fucking glared at him because Kulas knew he had this one in the bag, and the prosecutor could tell that Kulas knew he had it in the bag. And, and obviously, he just won two fucking cases before this. And so he's like, yeah, we're going 3-0. and oh. I'm about to whoop your ass one more time, fucker. And I'm just like, oh, this is going to be good. This is going to be really good. You know, like watching the fucking sparks fly. And the, pro the prosecutor, well, first... They pull out the baggie. This is another priceless. They pull out this skimpy little bag of shake. When, as I mentioned earlier, I had just purchased, like, a quarter. So when they first said, is this your pipe? Is this your bag? The first thing that comes to my fucking mind is, that ain't my fucking bag. <laughs> you guys smoked that shit. <laughs> and then it dawns on me, wait a minute, wait a minute. Those, those guys back in the fucking office... When I was in, you know, when I, when I was in jail, never really occurred to me why they were so nice. Think about it now. When they searched me, <laughs> they pulled that joint out of my pocket, right? Right. And his words were almost exactly, technically, this doesn't exist. So where do you think that joint went? You know, why do you think they let me just sit there until nobody was there, nobody had been there for a while, and at 1 a.m. they're finally like, so, you're cool. You could go. Because I got them stoned. <laughs> you know? I bet that they all, you know, they take turns doing different shifts, and everybody in the fucking lobby was like, oh, man, I got lobby tonight. Ain't no way I'm getting high. <laughs> you know, they're all just hanging around, bored. Like, all the street cops are going to get all the fucking drugs before it makes it to us. You know, we'll be lucky if fucking something makes it past them and we even get a single joint. And then in strolls jolly old me <laughs> with a fucking joint in my pocket I totally forgot about. And I guarantee, I guarantee that's what happened. The guy who strip searched me, he comes walking into the fucking lobby like, hey, uh, there's something waiting for you out there by the fucking gas meter where we take smoke breaks and then gives him a wink. 
you know, like, oh, shit. All right, I'll be out there for my 15 after I finish filling out this paperwork. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, that being said, looking at my fucking bag, seeing how little there was left, I was like, you guys didn't just smoke the joint. You smoked the whole damn, you smoked almost the whole fucking thing. But <laughs> still, that's just speculation. I definitely don't know if that's what happened, but uh, it kind of adds up. You know, if you ask me, even if they were trying to test it to see, make sure this is a legal substance, you probably didn't need to use that fucking much of a sample <laughs> to determine that. <laughs> Just one sniff. That's it. And you know what the fuck it is. <laughs> or one puff. I think that's probably how they conducted the experiment. Like, yeah, that's weed. All right. <laughs> no, 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 I don't think it is. Let me get one more try on that. <laughs> so it's getting to the point where this prosecutor knows he's toast and he is fucking sweating and trying to get me to give him anything you know to fucking work with to pin on me and like that was your pipe and that was your weed and it was in your possession you know and we were still trying to go with the story that it was my girlfriend's and so this dude is yelling in my fucking face just inches away yeah like i can see the sweat dripping off his forehead and the veins popping out like ren and stimpy detail shit you know what i mean <laughs> it's like this throbbing fucking pimple and a band-aid hanging off you know and all the hair underneath it and shit <laughs> and so it was fucking great <laughs> the fucking judge she was a female and she's like mr prosecutor he was simply being a gentleman and carrying his girlfriend's bag for her. Will you please step down? <laughs> and, and so even more, I'm just loving this shit, dude. I'm just like sitting there just slinking back like, <laughs> you know, like I wanted to just point at him and snicker, <laughs> but I didn't want to do anything to blow it. You know what I mean? Just stick to the story, say as little as you need to, because the fucking, you know, my PD's got it. And so, yeah, after the fucking, now I got the judge on my side. The judge just called me a gentleman. <laughs> and so I, I've got, I'm so just fucking sitting pretty. You know what I mean? Um, they threw the whole fucking thing out. I didn't get charged for a damn thing. And it sucks that my girlfriend did get charged. But her time had already been, it was way long gone. I mean, it took me like a year and a half to get this whole thing resolved. She was only on probation for like three months because she got tried as a minor, you know. And so even when she turned 18, the charges got dropped, you know, totally just off of her fucking record. She by then could now drive again and could now smoke again. And so, you know, it was like happily ever after. <laughs> <laughs> Except for it wasn't. We wound up, uh, you know, getting into some shit and she turned out to be a cunt. Fucking my fucking roommate behind my back for the last year and a half of our relationship. And that's the end of that story. Oh. Thank you all for joining. <laughs> that's, uh, that's story time with Unky Judas, dude. Yes, uh, please subscribe to this channel. Uh, I've got all sorts of crazy underground local music that you will not find anywhere else. And I'm going to be doing a hell of a lot more stuff like this. We're going to be bringing a live, well, possibly even a cartoon show. So stick around, folks, and have a happy t tomorrow. No, I don't like that. I don't like that. All right. <laughs> Stand by, and we will have a better slogan for our next episode. Thank you. Brought to you by Durpen Schlee. And remember, if it doesn't say Durpen, it's not Durpen Schlee. <laughs>